she was in the room of a resident and the woman looked up at her and said my but you are pretty the attendant blushed that's kind of you to say not many people would say that about me nonsense girl replied the resident just because you're fat doesn't mean you're ugly Sometimes you hear things at nursing homes that can be rather blunt, right? And there's an old saying, though, that beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, right? And that's good. That's a good thing. Because a lot of people today don't think of themselves as pretty. The world judges us on how we look who we are, etc., etc. But into the world that judges by appearances, I believe that God says, you're beautiful. You're pretty. Does the Bible say that? Does the Bible really think, and does God really think that way of us? I believe so. Because I believe that we are pretty to God and I believe that each person who God created is valuable to Him. He has taken the time to design us, to fashion us together in the womb. Before uh, uh, expecting mother even finds out she's pregnant, God knows. He knows the moment of conception. And I believe there's a verse that's the most famous verse in all scriptures. is John 3.16. And I believe that it's probably the most famous verse because it says something to each of us as his creation. For God so loved. That means God thinks you're pretty. God loves you. God created you. God made you just the way you are. Think about that. Don't let the world judge you. Look at yourself from the perspective of God. For God so loved the world that what? He gave what? One of his sons? No. His only begotten Son. No matter what the rest of the world may think of you, you are worth everything to God. To such an extent that God sent His only begotten Son to shed His blood to die for you. Now let's bring this idea that God thinks you're pretty to our text this morning. Open your Bibles or devices with me to Ephesians chapter 1. The book of Ephesians. Paul spends this entire first chapter of 23 verses. This entire chapter of Ephesians chapter 1. And, you know, to put it in a very practical way this morning, God spends chapter 1 to tell these believers here that they are pretty to God. Now, what do I mean by that? Look with me at just how the book begins. 
Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus, who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God of our Father and of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. He's referring to the church there, the believers. Now notice how many times he says us. He has chosen us in him, verse 4. Verse 5, he has predestined us. And verse 6 it says, he has redeemed us. In him we have redemption through his blood. Verse 9 says, he has made known to us the mystery. And he talks about us and the promises of God and what God has done for us and what God has called us to. And he's basically saying to that church, you're pretty. Before God, you were the most beautiful thing. Now generally, Paul doesn't spend that much time as he did with the church of Ephesus here, telling the people how attractive they are to God because of what he's done for them. But he did do that for the church at Ephesus. He spent the entire first chapter telling them who they are in Christ and why that is important. But why, why spend all that time? Why spend all these verses in that fashion, in that way, of letting the people know how they look to God. Well, apparently, someone came into that church and told them they weren't very pretty. That they weren't that great before God. And as we look and we understand the area of Ephesus, it wasn't just one church, but it was many churches there. Scholars believe that was made up the church there at Ephesus, but it was a unique church because Paul founded this church on his first missionary journey. And what became really unique about this church and why it was so dear to Paul's heart was that this church in Ephesus, or these churches that made up the church in Ephesus, they were comprised probably mostly if not a hundred percent of Gentiles. Gentiles. This is the mark of Paul's ministry. He was called a missionary to the Gentiles. And here was his church of Ephesus. And when Paul was away, some people have come in and said, you know, you're not very pretty before God because you're Gentiles. And you know what? Um, they came in and they began to tell this church, in fact, you're not very pretty. you got to do a whole new makeup. This thing just fell off again, Jane. I'm going to turn my volume off for a second. I just hate that noise. Maybe, yeah, I'm going to have to tape that thing on there. So, look at that. That just fell apart. we got to get a new one. All right, go ahead and just turn that with Turn this like this. I try not to pop my P's and T's now, right? you got to put me back on. Thanks. All right. Um, so as they're here and Paul's ministering and writing this letter to the church of Ephesus that's comprised of Gentiles who Paul became the missionary of and he prided himself that he was called to reach the Gentiles. What happened, there were some outsiders and they were the Jews. And they begin to come and tell the people, you know what, as Jews, you don't look like God's people. You need to follow the Jewish um, prescriptions to look right before God. You have to go through the Jewish ceremonial cleansing. You need to do all the Jewish laws, and then you will be beautiful before God. And Paul writes this whole first chapter to let them know, no. Gentiles, you are pretty before God. And that's why he uses those words to teach them that they're the Jews, the Jewish ones who came to them and were telling them that they're not pretty. Paul's basically saying, they're liars. Don't believe them. 
You are predestined. You are sons. You've been adopted. This is the will. This is the purpose of God. For God so loved the world. As John said, Paul would say there to them, right? He loves you. He created you. He made you. And you're part of His church. And you don't have to be a Jew to become a Christian. And you're a Christian because God called you into faith. Wow, what a message there that he's preaching to him. And then over in chapter 3 and verse 3, Paul even goes on to say this to them. We have maybe look at this a little later if I continue on in this um, book of Ephesians. But in verse 3 he says to them um, that by the revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, um, you can understand my insights into the mystery of Christ. And then he's going to say what it is. Um, verse 5, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and the prophets and the spirit. To be specific, he says, in verse 6, that Gentiles our fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise of Christ through the gospel. Saying, Gentiles, you can be saved. You, this is a mystery. This wasn't revealed in the Old Testament. The, the, the ceremonial washings, all those things were, were to the Jews, but it's now open to you in a grand way since the person and work of Jesus Christ. So, Paul's saying to them, you know what, church? You're beautiful. You're pretty before God. You're saved. You know what? Um, that love of God found you in such a way that now you're part of His wonderful body. You know, but sometimes in churches, even today, let's apply this, that you can have revival services, right? And I've attended some revival services, some I loved, and some I absolutely hated. I mean that. Some revival services are are really good. But there's others that turn out to be quite bad. What do I mean by that? You know what? Sometimes you get an evangelist up there who starts to preach, you know what? If you don't feel saved today, um, you're probably not saved. If you don't feel saved. And you know, in this one, I heard the, the guy preach and he told about a preacher's wife. He said that she had thought and admitted that she had doubts once in a while. Of, of her salvation. And he said to her, you know what? Those doubts prove that you're not a child of God. And you need to get saved. And you know what? There's, sometimes there's evangelists at the revival services. They can play into your fears quite well. They really can. They know how to do it. They know how to turn this little fear knobs on in someone's life. And, you know, that night he addressed the audience and, you know, he shared about how she struggled with her faith and, you know what, how she really got saved. And out of that crowd of 200 and some people that night, you know, you see about 50 or 75 go forward. Because they were convinced that because of their fears and their doubts, that they needed to get saved again. Sometimes you hear things like that and you think, you rascal you, right? You rascal you, who, who played into people's fears. Um, you don't care about these people, right? You, you don't care whether they were saved or not. You just wanted some more scalps for your own belt. Sometimes that happens. I don't know why, but sometimes they do. And you know, they go from revival service to revival church service and then into church and to church and they tell about all the people they got saved. Well, if you're saved because of a man, you know what, then you really have problems. Amen? I'm saved because of the man. 
Jesus Christ. That's the difference. And that, my dear friends, is the scenario that was happening right at the church of Ephesus. Saying, you know what, Gentiles? You have to become Jews first. You need to be circumcised. You need to do this. You need to, you need to become full-fledged Jews before you can receive any of the promises of God. So, Paul's telling them, just like 2,000 years ago, that you know what? Don't let people play into your doubts and your fears. Know who you are. Now, if you want to go to the movie theaters in Bedford, they're playing The Lion King. That was Janae's favorite movie of all times when we were growing up. And I would hold little Janae up she would pick her little feet up just like Simba. We'd go for walks in the woods and go to Pride Rock and all these things. I know, I love fantasy. I, I live 90% of my time in fantasy, right? Um, so, yeah, so she went to go see The Lion King last night. But there was a famous quote from The Lion King that, you know, when he saw his father up in the, the clouds, he said this, Simba, remember who you are. Remember. Then remember, he gives on. Remember, remember. He doesn't get quite like that. But you get the idea. Remember who you are. You know what? If you accepted Jesus Christ, if you met it, if you were sincere, and you know that Jesus died for your sins, and if you simply knew you are a sinner that needed to be cleansed, wanted to be cleansed, ready to be cleansed, you can be cleansed. Amen? And if you're cleansed, you're safe. You're secure. And Paul's telling those Gentiles all those things. God chosen you. God thought you were so pretty. God wanted to redeem you. This is a mystery that God would save the Gentiles. And what a salvation that has turned into in this world. And then in, we remember that. We turn to verse 7. Of Ephesians chapter 1 he says in him we have redemption I love that word and it means to be bought out of to be out to be bought out of the slave market you've been redeemed see we've all been slaves right we've all been been in the slave market and as the master as Jesus walked through the slave market he saw each of those slaves that are slaves to sin. And he says, you're pretty. And I'm going to die for you. And I'll make a way of redemption for you. In him, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. And Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. But what was the curse of the law? Well, the law of Moses declared what sin was, right? Um, we wouldn't know sin without the law. And the scripture says that we are condemned as sinners, as lawbreakers before God. You are condemned because you broke the law of God. Each of us deserve hell. But redemption changes that. Redemption means we have been redeemed. We have been forgiven through the blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. So the curse of the law is that we are all sinners. That includes each and every one of us. And the Bible says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is what? Eternal life. Or if I can use a theological word, eternal security, right? Eternal security through who? Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. When Jesus died for us, he paid the debt we owed. And his debt conquered the grave, conquered our sins, and changed us. And has given us eternal life. So Jesus redeemed us. He bought us. He bought us out of the slave market. Now the question gets back to, how much are you worth? How much are you worth? Now the 
old saying goes like this, something is only worth as much as someone's willing to pay for it. Ever hear that? That's so true. You know, you can, if you collect sports cards or football cards, or if you have some famous baseball cards, you had a lot of people used to go and look up the value and get the books on those. I don't even know if you can get the books today. It's probably all online subscription. I don't even know. But I like to do that and go back and see what the Troy Aikman card is worth. Used to be worth $50. And what I wrote on my cards, on the cases of them, I wrote what I paid at one point in time, like $18. And now it's $50. And it's fun to do those things. But you know what? If you put it on eBay, you might not get $50 for it. Because it's a Troy Aikman card, I'd probably get $150, even if the book value is $50. Because beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, right? If you have a Ben Roethlisberger card, it could be appraised at, say, $2, right? But you might not find someone who wants to pay you $2 for it. You might only get $0.10 cents for it. So what's the card worth? How many of you watched the show Pawn Stars? I like that. I like some of the other ones on there as well. And that's about the shop there in Las Vegas, Nevada. And, you know, they show clips of people bringing in guns and books and all these things to sell. And many of the people walk up there and, the, you know, they're expecting to get, get thousands and thousands, maybe even in some cases a million dollars, right, uh, for an item. And Rick is one of the owners there. And, you know, he will look over the item and he will, he will examine it. And sometimes he will know what it's worth and sometimes he doesn't know what it's worth. And then he will call in an expert, right? And the, the expert comes in and says, you know, um, this is worth $35,000. And, you know, Rick looks at the, um, the one who appraised it. Okay, this is worth $35,000. And then Rick looks to the uh, person who expects to get paid that. And he says, even though this is worth $35,000, to me... It's only worth $25,000 because I have to resell it again. I have to store it. I have to find a buyer for it, right? Why? Because value or beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, correct? So what Rick was saying was that the object's worth only a certain amount to him. It might be worth more to others, but to him, it's not worth $35,000. And then he begins to Jew them down. Well, Jewing down is exactly what's happening in the book of Ephesians. I remind you that the Jews there were looking at the Corinthians and saying, No, you don't got it right. You need to do this. You need to do that. You need to look our way. You need to embrace our customs if you want to be a Christian. So what does the Bible say you're worth? The Bible says in verse 7 of Ephesians, we've been redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ. You are so valuable to God that he was willing to give up his only, and I use the word, begotten son. His only son he gave up for a brief period of time for you. That's how special you are to God. And if beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, God thinks you are so pretty. Kind of neat when you think about it like that. Second, you have become a beneficiary of a vast inheritance. Of a vast inheritance. Um, inheritances are kind of neat, aren't they? I told my mom about the 80-20 plan because of the coronavirus. 
that those who approach the age of 80 can go and be euthanized and their children get $20,000 from the government. I know, I'm bad. Just hear me out. So, they, they, they practice that in other countries. But then I told her that, you know, there's a good 70-20 plan they're running in America that they're looking at the legislation with coronavirus and everything that's happening. You know, that it might be a good idea to go ahead and check out early and follow up on the 7020 plan. You know, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with this either. So I'm going to stop there. <laughs> she didn't take me up on it yet, but I don't know. I thought it was a good option in life, but I don't know. Um, but an inheritance is a good thing, right? Everyone agrees with that, right? Everyone would like an inheritance someday. But inheritance, though, is what we have in Jesus Christ. It's a true inheritance. Um, let me give an illustration, if I can. Back in April of this year, a firefighter went to an ATM to take out $200 from his account. He got his money, and he was one of those who read the slip of paper that comes out of the ATM. Usually I just grab the money and throw the, the little piece of paper away, right? But he got the piece of paper and he, he looked briefly there at the paper and he saw that his account balance. And in his account balance, it said $8.2 million. He couldn't believe it. So he ran his card again. Right? I would have been typing in like $500,000, you know, to withdraw. He ran it again, and sure enough, it said $8.2 million. He never had that much money in his entire life. Now, if he was a dishonest man, he would have probably kept running his card through and see how much he could get out of it, right? But he didn't, and he called the bank Monday to check it out. The bank looked at his account and said, I had, we have no idea how that money showed up in your account. But it's not there now. <laughs> One of these technical glitches in the day and age we live. All the money disappeared. They weren't sure how it got there, but they had the record it got there too. But guess what? As quick as it come, as quick as it went, right? Um, that's a true story. But if that money was there, do you realize how his life would have changed? You know, all the things he could have got till the money ran out, right? But with 8.2 million, that is just a drop in the bucket. A large bucket. Compared to our inheritance that we have in Jesus Christ. You know, we have such a wonderful inheritance. We are worth more money than the billionaires in this world today. We are worth more money than Facebook to God. We are worth more money than Bill Gates. You think about it. We are worth more money, and God is saying, you're pretty. And not only are you pretty, but you have an inheritance with me. Um, this is what, what he's saying here. Uh, look at verse 13. He says, In him you also, after listening to this message of the truth, of the gospel, of your salvation, having also believed, you, you were sealed with him with the Holy Spirit. Um, so, so I went further than what I wanted to there. I'll come back to that. But let me just go to this passage in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. It says, According to his mercy... The Father caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead to an inheritance, and here's what it says, it's imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. And then it says there in verse 3 of Ephesians, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with what? Every spiritual blessing. In the heavenly places in Christ. And I like the tense there because the tense is we already 
have it. I'm already blessed. In the heavenly places, if you are in Christ, you have this great inheritance, and it's already yours. It's in your account, and it would never be taken out. Amen? Guess what? You have a lifetime, an eternal lifetime, to enjoy that inheritance. That's better than paper money, right? <laughs> it's better than card money. This is real inheritance that, that we have. Verse 11 says it like this in Ephesians. Also, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his good will. So, we have an inheritance that we are guaranteed. Well, God says, I got a deal for you. And he says in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, when you believed in me, you got it. We have obtained it. Do you see that? It's like a past perfect tense here again. You know, it's already happened. It's already in our account, but it lasts for eternity. Now, sometimes... I went to get my, what was it, my dog license or something. Ever go in the courthouse building there in Holidaysburg? I didn't know this. You go in that dumb place. What you have to do is, is ridiculous because you, there's armed guards there. You think, oh my goodness, this is Holidaysburg. What am I doing here with armed guards, right? And, and then the armed guards, and then they got the metal detectors, right? And you got the people in suits running all every which way up there. And in order to pass to get inside, you know, you have to empty all your pockets, put them in a metal container, they run it through the machine, you go through the machine. And then by the time you look to your right, though, they have a little quick pass for people that just keep walking. You start to think, why in the world do they get to just walk in here? And I have to do this. Did I get in the wrong line? Right? Why didn't I just go a little bit further to the right? Um, how come they don't have to go through this? And I asked them that. Why don't they have to go through this? Why, why didn't I get in that line? And they said, they have a badge to prove they belong here. You know, when... We get to heaven. We need a badge, a mark, a card to show that we're in. And that card, that mark, that badge is right here in verse 13. In him you also, after listening to this message of the truth and gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were, what, sealed. There's the mark. How do you know that you're going to heaven? The Holy Spirit living within you is the mark. If you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, the Bible says you are sealed. That is your badge to heaven. The Bible calls us as believers, we are called temples, right? Where the Holy Spirit resides. And in the Gospel of John, John said, you know, when the Holy Spirit comes, He will be with you. For how long? Forever. We are a constant temple of the Holy Spirit. He resides within us. And when we die, and our spirit and our soul, when it's even reunited with our body, that seal of the Holy Spirit inside of us is proof. And when we stand before God someday, and He says that million dollar question, why should I leave you into my heaven? You could say, you know what? I have your spirit. Your blood and your spirit is all I need to get into heaven. He provided that for us as a In our text today that we looked at in Ephesians, there's three times in our text it says, to the praise of his glory. In verse 6, 
it says to the praise of his glory and then in verse 12 it says there um, at the end to the praise of his glory and then in verse 14 it says who has given us a pledge of our inheritance the proof of it if you would with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory now what does to the praise of his glory mean when we think about all these times it says to the praise of his glory it means this and commentators run wild with this idea but it means that you know what God the Father is proud of himself that he bought you that he laid out this wonderful plan of salvation and he prides himself in the idea that he redeemed us because he loves you that's me to the praise of his glory is God's own pride and our redemption wow God thinks that highly of me that he likens it almost to himself that you know what he says good job to himself that he redeemed us because you know what that price that Christ had to pay for our redemption was so great no one else could ever pay but because beauty is in the eyes of the beholder God the Father looked down and even though we were dead in trespasses and sin, even though we looked so filthy to God, even though we looked like miserable, wretched creatures with a sinful heart and a sinful life, God somehow said, I love you. I love you. And I'm willing to die for you and I'm going to redeem you and nobody in this world can ever say to you you're out me you are my child and you are pretty you are beautiful isn't that neat you're beautiful just the way let's pray Father thank you so much thank you so much for loving us so much thank you that no matter how old, how young no matter our sizes you love us and you say we are beautiful people Lord, I wish this message would resonate within us. And I wish, Lord, that this message would resonate to all the people on the streets, all the protesters. Lord, if we're trying to find affirmation from this world, we would never find it. But if we look to you, we will find everything we ever need and ever want and ever desire. Thank you for your wonderful promises to us. Thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for calling us to yourself. In Jesus' name.